Well, hi guys. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation to speak to you today. Um, I must apologise that I can't be there in person. Uh, this little virus has certainly curtailed all travel. And, uh, and even if I could get to the UK, which we could, uh, I wouldn't be allowed to come back to New Zealand. So I decided I'd have to stay here and, uh, and talk to you over this uh, video recording. Now, the other apologies I must give you is uh, uh, that I can't talk to you live. Um, the reason for that is that as you will be listening to this, I should be uh, sailing out onto the Hauraki Gulf in Auckland to uh, watch races three and four of the America's Cup. Look, I don't know what happened in race one and two because they're not for another two days yet. Um, but I'm certainly hoping that uh, we will have, New Zealand will have beaten the Italians. Now, I'm very sorry uh, and I feel sorry for you guys that uh, Ineos Team UK uh, couldn't uh, be the the uh, challenges for the America's Cup this time. Um, actually, I'm not that concerned, to be quite honest. It's just like a Wales all-black rugby test. Uh, it was inevitable. So uh, so do come back next time. Uh, we'll be glad to have you back uh, here in New Zealand. Um, so fingers crossed, seven zip, and the Italians will be sent packing. Um, now, look, just in case you haven't been uh, uh, introduced, as I, I don't know what the story is, uh, my name is Roger Cook. I am New Zealand Food Safety's Principal uh, Advisor Strategic Science and uh, Risk Assessment. Um, look, I've been running around for this last year, in fact, a year and a week now. Uh, uh, I'd like to say trying to mitigate the risk of, of COVID to New Zealand, but it hasn't really been the case. I've really been mitigating the risk of, of uninformed, um, uh, egotistical media uh, commentators and uh, um, social media trolls. Um, that has taken more time than it has actually putting in place uh, controls for the virus itself. Now, I, I, you know, I've been in this role since 1995, so uh, certainly a long time now. And I thought in that time as the principal food microbiologist for the organisation, I would have uh, had some large advantage in this area. But um, uh, I've got to tell you that uh, that it's been hard work and uh, any advantage I thought I had, I certainly don't. So it's, uh, and I'm sure that you're all, all struggling with that as well. Now, one of the advantages I have had uh, over the period of time is, is that I get to work very closely with uh, overseas regulators, uh, my compatriots or my peers, should I say, and also science uh, providers of which I, I assume uh, you as well as industry are. Um, I get to represent New Zealand on Codex Food Hygiene. I get to represent New Zealand on a joint Australia-New Zealand Ministerial Forum on Food Regulation. And, um, and with your Paul Cook, um, uh, we're no relation by the way, uh, I'm on the GEMRA working uh, group for STEX uh, in foods and, uh, and I'm also very fortunate and privileged to be a member of uh, the ICMSF. Um, so importantly, I am the current uh, international first international president of uh, IAFP, uh, and I suppose I'm probably going to be the shortest in history as well, uh, being just nine months out of a full term of twelve months due to to COVID, and uh, and I'll be the first never to have set foot in the US um, uh, during his presidency. And, uh, and I'm also going to be the first to miss both the, both the inauguration conference and uh, the conference where I hand over to uh, Ruth Petrin as the next president. So uh, I don't think they'll be giving me a gavel uh, in Phoenix. I think I'll be given a, a massive wooden spoon. But, uh, but those are the breaks. And, uh, and we've got on and, and made the most of it. Um, look, speaking of IFP, I'm not going to give you the, uh, the, the traditional sales pitch. Uh, but I will remind you uh, that its mission is to provide uh, food safety professionals w worldwide uh, with a forum to exchange information uh, on protecting the food supply. That's, that's, a, that's a pretty simple thing to do. And, and when you look at the speakers here today, uh, they represent uh, across that spectrum of the world, but also with the UK and New Zealand, we're about as diametrically opposite uh, and, as, and as distant as, as you can be. And, uh, and, and, and that's pretty, pretty uh, special to me. In fact, I, I remember my first time at the IEMFIS, as it was known back there in, in, uh, in uh, 1987 in Orlando, I met your Roy Betts from Camden and Chorleywood uh, Research Association. 
and uh, in fact I met him at uh, Disney World but uh, that's another story. The last time I was in the UK which I think was about 15 years ago uh, I visited Roy and Joy Gaze and uh, John Holler at Camden uh, and, and got a, a good taste of British food, uh, British food safety in fact, uh, that I'll never forget. I had this delicious lunch uh, at, the, at the research uh, uh, labs and uh, but later that night after a long rail trip down to Bristol, uh, the meal returned to me and it was pretty violent and it stayed with me on the train to Heathrow and it stayed with me on the 24 hour flight to New Zealand. And I've got to say that um, I've always considered that the best possible way to demonstrate the worldwide food safety connectedness uh, between our countries. So, so thanks guys, it's, it's stuck with me for, for a long time now. So anyway, enough of the small talk, um, onto the topic at hand, which was uh, global food safety in the COVID-19 era. Um, and I wasn't too sure about how to talk about this, um, so I've split it into three sections. Um, is it food safety? Is it not food safety? And what effect does it have on trade? Um, so let's just go through this and uh, and I'd love to be able to say uh, uh, interrupt me whenever you want to because it would be terrific to have you do so uh, but that uh, and I'm always available on email afterwards to uh, to ask any questions but anyway we're all facing this uh, unprecedented challenge with uh, the COVID pandemic um, there's no denying that it's a that it's a massive uh, human uh, public health uh, risk and, a, and, a, and, and it's had a, a huge effect on us generally both from the virus perspective and the, and the emotional perspective and, um, and we can only hope that the vaccines that are now being that are available to us and being rolled out really really fast in fact in the US they're, they're vaccinating uh, 2 million people a day that would have New Zealand vaccinated in two and a half days um, I think it's going to take us several months, but uh, but that's uh, fantastic, and the results to date look look tremendous, and uh, and especially those from the UK. So uh, so I'm i hope you've had your jabs, and uh, and uh, and that risk is going to be mitigated. But anyway, let's let's just go back a little bit and look at it from the perspective of food. Uh, is co was or is COVID a food safety issue? Um, the FAO WHO interim guidelines. Uh, what do they call them? The COVID-19 and Food Safety Guidance for Food Businesses. They were published in April last year, 2020, and they suggested that it is. And therein lies the problem. And we'll, we'll, we'll address that as we go through uh, my talk. Um, I'll state right up, right here, right now and here, uh, that there's no definitive evidence that sars cov 2 virus uh, can be transmitted on food or its packaging. So I'm just going to say that. I don't think there's any doubt of that, but let's go through it anyway. Um, yes, viral nucleic acid has been detected on food and it has been detected on food packaging. Uh, and that food and packaging has come from countries in which COVID-19 is rampant in the community and it's going right through the food process, uh, processing premises and it's unhindered. So why would you not expect to get virus on that packaging. Um, even here in New Zealand, uh, back in our first wave, uh, we had a couple of cases in a cold store uh, and we detected COVID-19 nucleic acid uh, on desks and on lockers and on doors and on paperwork. Um, and we detected on the shrimp, shrink rack, not shrimp, shrink wrap of, of one of the pallets that had just been packed uh, or in, a few days earlier by the, the workers, the four workers that, that became ill. And um, what was more important is we never detected nucleic acid in the places those sick workers didn't get to go to. And that told us immediately um, that this was a matter of contamination as opposed to a cause for their, for their illness. And, uh, and we'll come back to that again later on as well. Um, so um, the next thing is, uh, and I, I, actually, before I go there, let's just consider that I bet you that you will find all sorts of other viruses on, on that packaging as well. I'm sure there's influenza virus and rhinoviruses and, uh, and uh, um, whatever you want to find, you will find it on that packaging if we went and looked. And it's not something we normally do. 
So, um, so the next question is yes, the virus will survive on stainless steel and on plastic and on cardboard and remain active under laboratory conditions, uh, supposedly representing those in cold stores. Okay, so these have been done in the lab. But it's questionable that the, the conditions that they used in the lab are actually occurring uh, out there in cold stores or in, in food premises. And, uh, and we all know that virus activity drops off uh, really rapidly and certainly faster than uh, transportation uh, times to global markets. So uh, whether these particular studies represent uh, reality, uh, we just don't know, uh, but we suspect not. Yes, uh, virus and suspension and high teeters, when you add a little bit of meat to it, does survive. Well, surprise, surprise, I'm sure it pretty much does. All it shows you that, that, that meat uh, doesn't kill off virus, which is not surprising. Okay, uh, but there isn't evidence that the virus on meat actually stays active. Um, peer review would surely have rejected these papers that actually are, are suggesting this. And if not, then I wonder why not. Um, yes, there is epidemiological evidence, uh, including complex modelling of people flows and things and hot spots of illness, supporting food as a source in the Beijing market uh, from last year. Uh, but we find that severely flawed and, uh, and, and the modelling ignores, and, and the interpretation, ignores so many confounding possibilities uh, of people transport and, and other places where the people may have mixed, not just in the market stalls themselves. And, um, and again, peer review of, of these uh, pre, pre-publication uh, scientific studies surely would have uh, rejected the assertions uh, that the authors have been making. Uh, and and, so, and no, there has not been one case uh, reported in the literature or reported anywhere that definitively links uh, the consumption of food or contact with food packaging uh, to a human case. Okay, so now you might argue that this could be because it's hard to see them and especially so in, in countries where person to person spread in the community is rampant. Um, you can't see the wood for the trees, so to speak. Um, and that'll be correct. But what about here in New Zealand, where the virus has virtually been eliminated from the, the community? Um, if it's transmitted by food or packaging, and we import a lot of food uh, and children frozen food into New Zealand, uh, that we would expect to, and we import that from countries where uh, COVID in the community is rampant, then we would expect to see cases and clusters randomly turning up in the community, but we don't. Um, now, like in the UK, all travellers that return to New Zealand, uh, since the first wave anyway, are sent to purgatory. They're sent into managed isolation and quarantine for two weeks. They get three tests while they're in there and they cannot come out until they are free of symptoms and free of virus. Um, and that seems to work exceptionally well. Um, and it's great to have an, an island nation so far away from anywhere that um, uh, it takes a week here to get by, uh, get here by sea, and um, and uh, nobody's actually tried to swim from Australia as far as we know. So it's not like the English Channel, which uh, which is quite swimmable and certainly uh, easily sailed in a small yacht. Um, but but having said that, we do have the odd escapee from um, from uh, managed isolation, and I'm talking about the virus, not the people. Um, and, and, and gaps that appear that get plugged, of course. And um, these are linked to MIQ facilities or the border. And um, all have been shown to be person to person and all have been shut down really, really quickly. Not one has an unexplained link that could be attributed to something like food coming into the, contaminated food or contaminated food packaging coming into the country and causing an illness that's not linked to the border or not apparently linked to the border. So it's our conclusion, and that's our conclusion one, I suppose, uh, and we agree, and the ICMSF agrees with us, or we agree with the ICMSF, I suppose, and most other regulatory risk assessment groups that we talk to, that there is no direct food safety risk from food or food packaging. Um, and I dare say uh, that, um, since we've, uh, since the WHO investigators have been to China, that they have been 
suggesting that that's not the case as well, at least not in generally traded foods. Um, Asian trade in, in frozen or, or chilled foods uh, such as, what are they, ferret badgers and uh, bamboo rats, which are not globally traded, at least outside Asian countries. Um, uh, so there doesn't seem to be a risk. Um, but that's not what the interim guidance says. So that guidance as it's written now and published on the WHO world site is, is, is blatantly and simply wrong. Uh, it's misleading. We told them so on the 7th of June uh, last year. The UK, EU, Australia, US and Canada and ICMSF have all told them the same. Um, but they're only now looking at an update. So it will be interesting to see what, that's, what that update says, how far it goes. Um, I'll come back to that shortly. So if it's not a direct food safety risk, what is the risk to the food industry? Um, and, and what effect can that have uh, globally? Well, so it can be an occupational risk to uh, food safety, uh, an occupational safety risk to workers. And, and that, that is quite, quite, uh, quite visible. We've seen a lot of illness overseas in food processing companies. Uh, especially the meat industry, and we see, and I work from the US suggests that actually in some communities, 60% of the community transmission is actually occurring through meat processing companies. Um, we know that the, the the environment in those companies and those 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 particular processes is conducive to survival of the virus and transport. You know, high humidity, uh, cold temperatures that promotes virus survival. Limited airflow, you need airflow to break up, break the aerosols uh, and, and move them on so that you don't get a build up in front of workers. There's a lot of physical exertion, so a lot of breathing, a lot of, lot of virus being released if, if it's in the, in the premises. There's a lot of shouting because it's noisy, so, so people are yelling at each other and, and, and you get aerosols forming in that way. And of course, there are a lot of close people and uh, so you get a lot of opportunity for, for those aerosols to, to, to transfer between. So if there aren't any measures in place to stop that, then yes, the virus is just gonna say, Merry Christmas, thank you, and, and I'll be on my way uh, from person to person to person. So um, uh, if then COVID hits those processes, then staff attendance will initially drop. Now, unless you've got processes in place, that means that your process efficiency starts dropping. That could then mean that your process hygiene starts dropping. And if your, your process hygiene starts dropping, then you start seeing food safety issues, the possibility of food safety issues coming, coming through. Now, I haven't actually had any of that reported, and certainly we haven't seen that here in New Zealand, um, not to date anyway, and, uh, and, and, and that's good. Now, now, what there's a corollary to that. If it gets to the stage where, that's, where, where you can't get workers, then eventually the business is closed down. And if you're an ingredient supplier, then the supply chain starts breaking down and continuity fails. So what you get is that companies start changing their formulation because they can't get uh, um, uh, item X from, from somewhere, so they replace it with item Y. Now that starts breaking down labelling rules and we've had to actually um, uh, put in place emergency rules that allow some flexibility and compliance uh, judgments uh, for companies so they can replace things. You know, salt from one supplier can be replaced with salt from another. That makes no difference. But, but in some cases, the formulations will change and, uh, and they're breaking the law if they don't inform their, um, their, uh, the public about those changes. And so we've allowed them to do that off-label uh, to get around that. And, uh, and so these are the sorts of uh, practices we've had to put in place and, re and emergency regulations we've had to put in place. And we've done that uh, with consultation with, with other countries such as the UK and EU and US and Canada and, and Australia uh, to make sure that we've, we've uh, been harmonised in our approach to this to, to prevent difficulties in trade between the countries. Um, so let's just look at what we've done in New Zealand in terms of uh, the food business anyway, uh, to try and mitigate the risk of, of these businesses getting into trouble. So uh, after the first few cases in New Zealand, the government, and you may have heard this, they went fast and they went hard. So we went straight into lockdown 
and the uh, Ministry of Health and WorkSafe, who are our uh, OSH regulators, uh, and the Prime Minister all said, right, first thing we want, everybody stays at home uh, and you have to be two metres apart. Well, that's fine. And our boss has said, right, well, we'll close all businesses where they can't be two metres apart. And we said, oh, that's not fine. We can't do that. That will shut down a lot of the food, the food businesses, uh, especially, again, those at-risk companies, the, the, the meat industry and the meat processing companies, where actually there are machines and, and systems that require people to be within two metres, maybe within one metre. And so we spent quite a lot of time coming up with what we thought were scientifically proven, uh, good evidence for alternatives that would allow these companies to continue processing while the rest of the country are following the rules. And uh, now New Zealand Food Safety and the Ministry for Primary Industries don't have any regulatory, regulatory uh, ability to do this. Uh, uh, to, to enforce this. So these guidelines, which you will find on our website if you want to go looking for them or I can send them to you, they, um, they all went out as guidance, but they were signed off by MedSafe, who had the delegation for enforcement from the Ministry of Health, who had the regulatory framework and the, uh, and the, the notice and law the, called uh, Section 70 of the COVID uh, uh, COVID of the of the, the Health Act, which allowed us to to put this guidance out there and and for it to be enforced by by WorkSafe. So, um, so what we were able to do is put that out and enable our essential businesses to continue. And and just from that, it, it gave it gave quite a flexible approach because at the same time we put in um, uh, uh, law which set aside four alert levels. So alert level four was was community cases of community transmission of, of COVID uh, and not yet under control. Uh, community uh, alert level three, uh, community cases, but controlled and now being localized and starting to be regionalized. Uh, alert level two, uh, a few cases of, of community, got it under control, but a little bit of regionalization is allowed in level one, which was no community cases or very few, uh, and and uh, but but community cases in all of our countries around us and and where we trade with and where travellers are coming from, return returnees, return New Zealand is coming back to New Zealand. So uh, so we we generally have been sitting in in, in level one uh, since uh, uh, May last year. Um, with with the odd little blip up to two, but anyway, this these guidance um, uh, all are, uh, the degree of implementation of these measures um, was proportionate to the risk to New Zealand and to businesses, and it was was proportional to the alert level. So so as the alert level came down, the measures the degree of implementation of the measures uh, was reduced, uh, which which is a good way. It's a proportionate response. Um, of course, workers were told to stay away when they're when they're feeling ill, especially with respiratory symptoms, and and uh, and they had to go and test get tested, and that gets covered under the under the Ministry of Health alert guidelines. Uh, the the uh, workers were being monitored in the workplace. Uh, they had to work. We formed workplace bubbles where you have small teams that if anybody got crook in there, then you could separate them off instantaneously, and the rest of the business could keep move, keep. Uh, keep uh, uh, processing. Uh, physical distancing plus special rules when you get down with PPE and dividers and and uh, and uh, 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 special plans and and, and uh, protocols for when they got down to less than one metre. And there goes my phone falling over, sorry, I'll just sit it back up again. There we go. Uh, always a technical problem. Uh, we changed group behaviour and uh, we enforced general etiquette, such as coughing into the into the elbow, etc., and uh, and there was sanitising, and uh, and we looked at work uh, uh, air flows as well. So look, when we put that all in place, and and just keeping a note of the time, uh, combine that with the elimination strategy at the border, etc., all of those prevented any COVID getting into the workplace. Okay. So it wasn't in the community. It never got into the workplace. Um, we never got any businesses shutting down. We never had any problems. Uh, 
and uh, and we were able to continue trading. And in fact, our meat industry had its best year ever uh, over 2020. Um, so the issue was though, so food safety problem, no. Worker safety problem, yes, but well controlled. The problem, we thought this was the end of the story, but the problem isn't. So out there, there's a lot of incomplete science. There's misinformed opinion, which has driven some inappropriate perceptions, and this in turn threatens to disrupt our domestic and global trade. Now, so if we base, look at the interim guidelines from the WHO, some of our trading partners have taken them literally and say, it's a food safety problem. Uh, and we think frozen food and chilled food is the issue. That's uh, non-peer-reviewed, as I said, pseudoscience, poor epidemiology, poor risk assessment, um, and unfortunately those trade barriers are escalating. So despite being COVID-free and having these risk proportionate controls, we are in no community cases, so no way that COVID could get into the meat plant, then could get into the packaging or onto the food, we are still being told that we can't export to these countries. And we're getting this from the importers who are getting this from the ports, unless our food industry, our exporters, test their workers for COVID. Now that puts a huge strain on our testing uh, uh, capacities and capabilities but there isn't COVID in the workers to test for. So, and what's the sampling plan? How would you de detect it? They want the product and packaging tested, but there isn't SARS virus in the environment. They want to disinfect the passages, the, the packages, but there's still no um, SARS virus. And they want to implement cleaning programs that are, that are stronger and greater than any we were put in place for Listeria. And Listeria is a far trickier organism to control than what SARS virus is. And they want that at all levels because the FAO, WHO interim guidelines does not specify any difference in risk level. It's just one size fits all. And I'm sorry, one size doesn't fit all. So we need a risk-based escalating region-based regulation and procedures. And that's what we've put in place. Um, and we're hoping um, that the new updated WHO FAO guidelines uh, may actually state that. We're then hoping that the tra our trading partners will, will then reverse what they've been doing and trade in food will, will uh, continue. Um, the price won't go up to cover what are inappropriate mitigation uh, strategies with costs. And... Um, and of course, at the same time, we've got a, vaccina a vaccination program going in. And by the look of it, that's going to be uh, very successful. And all of this that we've been talking about will soon become irrelevant. Um, so I guess that is my conclusion too, is that trade is being disrupted. Um, and we may see more disruption over the next six months. And we may see that disruption until the uh, FAO WHO guidelines are uh, made to represent a, a proper risk and, and regionalization basis. So here's hoping. Um, more importantly, I suppose these are the four questions I have uh, for you to take as a take home message. Uh, will I ever get back to the UK? Will the UK ever get the America's Cup back on its shores? Go Burnley and its uh, Kiwi striker with for a magnificent goal this last weekend. And uh, go Wales in the Six Nation Rugby Championship. I'm actually hoping that uh, you can take it out. Uh, fantastic rugby. So um, finally, hope you can all get to IAFP in Phoenix in July. Um, I won't be there, unfortunately, because uh, our government's not letting us travel. And, uh, and I don't really mind. Um, but I, it, uh, it's looking like it may very well go live uh, at this time. Uh, the vaccination program in the US and in other countries may be sufficient by the time we get to your Northern Hemisphere summer um, uh, for your governments and your organisations and yourselves, obviously, to, to think it's safe enough to travel so that you can get back to doing what IFP does well, which is uh, network with people, meet your friends, uh, form those liaisons, um, uh, 
go and visit the, the Roy Betts of the world um, many years after you first meet them. Hopefully uh, not with the same connection that I had. But um, uh, and, and so, uh, so thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. Hope you're having a wonderful time. By now, I will be at anchor out on the uh, America's Cup course, and, uh, and I hope to see you soon. Thanks very much. I uh, hope the rest of the conference goes well. Bye now.